Broadcasting live to Bill's Mafia Worldwide with Greg Thompson and Aaron Quinn. Welcome to the NFL. Doesn't matter what's happened before today. Today's a brand new day. It's a brand new season. Your number one podcast for objective Buffalo Bills coverage. No matter where you are, we got you covered. Good evening and welcome to the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. You are joining your host, Greg Thompson, along with my now distant, once again, partner in crime, Aaron Quinn. Aaron, how are we doing? Dude, I'm doing all right. I uh, well, First of all, I miss you. It was so nice to spend that weekend with you and Eric and our new friend, my new friend, Michael Thomas, a uh, friend, friend of the show here. So uh, great weekend out there in Las Vegas. Thanks to bookseats.com. And we'll get into that a little bit, but uh Really wanted to say thank you here before we get the show started to all the fans and support that we got throughout this weekend. Not just you and I, Greg, but the whole network in general. Just everything those guys did all weekend going live streaming and all the support that they received in the chat room and the views that they got this weekend. Plus, I couldn't even keep up with Twitter of just everybody tagging each other. And it, it just felt like a really cool weekend. Then plus live there, we had a plenty of people come up to us and say, hey, we love the show. Cool. And yeah, it just felt like a really cool week. We put a lot of work you know, in behind yeah. this and, and to do this and to go out to Vegas uh, with you guys, have a good time and then talk to fans and have people showing us the appreciation, not just for us, but the whole network as a whole it was just really cool. It was really, you know, on the flight back, just reflecting on sort of how cool it is that all this is coming together for us and, and the fans really appreciate it. So I want them to know how, how great it feels to, to feel that appreciation. It really was awesome. It, it was very cool. There were a lot of very kind, very nice people. We got a lot of very generous messages and uh, thoughtful messages and being able to go out and, you know, have book seats send us out there to be able to, um, you know, have a good time, cover the draft. Everything that they did was was really cool. Um, so I'm really excited about the chance to work with them. A uh, big date for bookseats.com coming up uh, May 12th. So next Thursday, next week's show, we're going to really be priming up the opportunity there. And then as soon as those dates hit, you could jump out there, get your trips booked wherever you need to go for those awesome road trips that are coming up on the schedule that will be announced uh, next week. So can't wait to be able to see that. You'll be hearing more about them. But, yeah, I mean, it was just an awesome overall, you know, weekend, an awesome opportunity to meet Here, people. Chris. Chris says, did you guys want any money? And I, <laughs> after speaking to Greg's accountant, he cannot disclose <laughs> whether or not he won money because there might be some tax implications if he answers honestly. Um, yeah, I won an amount of money that I had to wait by a security area for them to go back and verify that the amount of money I won was real and that I didn't steal chips. I was sleeping. I was that sleeping was through cool. all this. I, I was, I, that I was, was like, probably two and a half hours deep sleep. I won't lie. That was at like two in the morning yeah. at that point that I was yeah. waiting to get my amount of chips verified. So that was cool. I had a, a very nice trip from that standpoint. Uh, but yeah, it was awesome. Good to hang out with everybody and everything that was there. So with the draft itself, um, I will say, you know, we'll get into each player. We're going to do a grade. We're going to do who were the winners and losers um, on the roster based on those picks and who wasn't picked or what positions weren't picked. Um but I, I will say that the draft was a positive overall from a position standpoint. They checked almost every position, except for one. I had one position that I thought was going to be picked that we'll get into. But other than that, you know, they checked the boxes on a lot, but probably only two of the names that I expected. So overall, I was um, excited about who was there, but was a little surprised in who the names were at some of those spots. Um, and I'm excited to see what, what you thought as, as we get into some of those. Yeah. So I'm kind of with you on this. So going into the draft, right. It was all, this is sort of a cherry on top as long as you get that corner. Right. Yep. It, it, yep. And for me, it didn't have to happen in the first round. I know a lot of fans wanted that. And the, congratulations. That's exactly what we got. And a lot of fans wanted a super athletic one. And congratulations. You got that too. I needed it in those first three rounds in terms of this is a guy that, maybe he's not a day one starter, but can fill in for Trey like, and that we can have a solid corner two going forward. I think that they exceeded that. They went up and got a guy that they liked a lot more than I did. Um, we'll get into him more specifically, but you, you check that right off. And so from that point on, it, it really was cherry on top of a really good roster, right? Let's, eventually leave with a punter that's a big need that they didn't address in free agency then there was a couple other needs i think they got got a number of them 
again, sort of like you said, not necessarily the names I associated mm-hmm. with the Bills throughout this mock draft process, but maybe that's something that we need to self-scout sort of how we approach the, the draft process. I know there was some stuff I learned this year not to do again, um, but the names weren't all familiar in this draft process. There was, I have some issues that we'll talk about, but some spots where I think they made up for it. And overall, I think the roster got better. They get improved. And I think you walked away in my opinion with a uh, hit success rate where I wanted to run around at least 50%. I think that you could probably get some more out of this. So that's where really what I'm shooting for walking into a draft is feeling good about half the players that they can come in and contribute right away. And I think that they did that. I, I think that's spot on. And, and I honestly, I think I feel pretty confident that five of them are going to get snaps, but sure. I feel really good that four of them are. having a punter makes it easy, right? You know, correct, correct. you're driving a punter. Yeah. He's going to be your punter. So yeah. that helps. But yeah, no, I think, if you add in special teams contributions, then yeah, I think you can get five of those guys out of this draft right away. Yeah. So let's dive right in. We'll, we'll start right off at the top. Our man, Kair Elam, a uh, cornerback out of the university of Florida. And he's one that I'm going to, it's going to freak people out when I say this, but I'm going to compare to Josh Allen. Um, and I'm going to compare him to Josh Allen in the sense that immediately after the pick, versus a day or two later after I saw videos, interviews, and background information on the diligence, work ethic, note-taking, all that stuff, I was like, oh, well, no, duh, that's the guy they picked. Of course, that's the guy that they picked. So anyone who didn't see the video from Kair Elam, I believe it was at the Combine when he came in and said, hey, you know, I'm the best note taker in this draft. If you want to take a look at my notebook, here are all the notes that I've taken on myself, self-scouting, big plays we gave up, explosive plays we gave up, things I need to do better, upcoming opponents, and areas for improvement. And you literally saw Sean McDermott's like brain explode as he watched that. And at one point, literally had to stop himself from smiling um, and like keep a straight face for it. Of course he made sense. So then you combine that with, you know, 6'2", 4'3", and the athleticism and what's there. Add in what Eric brought up about how elite his 2020 film was before some of the coaching changes. So a guy that I was probably part of the group that bought in too much to some of the comments of, oh, we're not sure on his tackling technique or how willing of a tackler he is, and that I just let that whitewash me into – well, of course, Sean McDermott's not going to pick a guy that has tackling issues a corner. That's such a prominent role that even if he's good at the other things, that's just a disqualifier. They won't consider him that I didn't give him the time that I should have ahead of time. And certainly that's going to be a lesson learned for me. So um, that's the way I compared it to Josh Allen. And I gave it a B plus. You know, I, I don't know that he's an absolute perfect player, um, but the fact that he was their athleticism size, all the other intangibles that we now saw at a premium position of need. I thought it was a very, very good pick. And I think you could even go more. Um, I'll add in one other piece. My winners and losers were pretty clear. You know, Dane Jackson, probably a little bit of a, of a loser on that one, just because if they waited and say only got a fourth or fifth round corner, he probably had a much better start. It's not a guarantee that they start, but first round picks usually start for this team. And every one of them has for about, five years running here. Um, but I don't know that there were a ton of other losers beyond there. Um, maybe one of the pending free agents. Sure. Yeah. I would say I'll, so I'll start out with, cause I think you've got mine winner and losers here for that. And then I think Dane Jackson is, but I think that's got a trickle down effect to the rest of to your Nick sure. McLeod's and Cam stuff Lewis, like that. Like everyone Elijah that gets Griffin. pushed back one, it hurts those Cam Lewis's Nick McLeod's chances of having anything meaningful on this roster outside of a, clinging to a practice squad spot. So I think all those depth cornerback guys had a rough draft, if you will, because I, I think that some of them aren't going to be able to hang on. But Elam, this one was weird to me. And I sort of, I agree with your idea that this is like a Josh Allen, but for me, it comes from, you know, after this pick, it's settled. And you had heard me in a lot of the DMs that we share in of like wondering what, people were missing on Elam when we were talking about these cornerbacks in this range and his name kept coming up throughout this range. And he was always sitting there sort of hanging out in 25 through 30. 
and he was the constant throughout this draft process where other guys kind of were hanging out there and then they wrote, you know, McDuffie was started out in that area and then he took off and guys, Andrew Booth was kind of in there and then he dropped out. Yeah. Uh, and so there was always these guys, but Elam was consistent. Every time I asked every group or whoever it was, I would get the same answers, the tackling sloppy at times, got beat a bunch in the SEC, things like this. And they just sort of wrote him off. And I think early on, I, I fell for this too, where early on people wrote him off during this process. And so I sort of did too, and just kind of had him in that, well, he's more of a second round guy, but probably too early for us to come back up and get him. So he's kind of hanging on this no man's land where he's not really on the Bills radar. And then maybe he should have been a little bit more yeah. on our radar and, and doing more diligence. And for me, I think, getting a little bit lazy in my evaluation of prospects, especially at a position like cornerback. Like there was a number of guys in this draft and I definitely did a lot of homework and put hours in, but you know, missing on a guy that really is that first second round guy and not getting as much view into him as I probably should have in this process. That's on me. So that's something I learned is to not necessarily go with the hive thought yeah. that's out there and, and go where people are because people are going to miss even the people that are putting those things out there will tell you that they miss at yeah. times uh, what teams want so uh, doing more due do, 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 do diligence on these picks and i agree once the pick was made and sitting there with you and eric and sort of seeing it and, and processing it and seeing this athleticism and then getting that behind the scenes which i think is really important these uh, the meetings and stuff this is the part oh, that God. we have no access to it, up until if you had day. seen if you had seen that video clip beforehand sure how much higher would you have ranked him in the likelihood of the Bills? Sure. Oh yeah. Very high. And even some of the clips that I've gone now further and seen, this is something that I think I, you know, I did it with the quarterback class and Josh Allen of really like going through these guys, press conferences and how, and their interviews and other things. And, and maybe I need to start doing that with whatever the priority is for that draft to dig in just a touch deeper. Cause I think if you start to look at some of his interviews and even how he talks about the decision to go to Florida and that it's not a four year decision, that's a lifetime to see you're associated to that school for the rest of your life. Like those types of culture and understanding and the maturity are things that that's just another check. I'm not saying it makes the bills draft you, but it just adds that book of check marks. And you start talking about athleticism of RAS of 8.65 RAS. Like that's a check mark for the bills, right? We know they're oh, going yeah. with RASI guys. You start to add in the notebook. That's a check mark. You start oh, yeah. to add in the pedigree of NFL family. That's a check mark. You, you build up all these little check marks. And I think then you're able to probably target guys a little bit more specifically. We're five years in here, four years into being drafts of, now we've got an understanding of the type of guys that they want to bring in at these different positions. And then they check those boxes here for Bill's guys. I just missed out on a few of them. So yeah. missing out on Elon was tough, but overall this is a positive pick for me. He's a positional need. He gives you everything. Everyone on Twitter and in the podcast world has wanted from that cornerback two position, that ability to have a little bit more flexibility in what your defense can do. Maybe a guy that can, you know, spell a Trey White could become eventually a true number one corner in this league. He's got the right DNA. It's a culture fit, NFL pedigree. All those are positives. His fundamentals need to be cleaned up, but you can't you can't teach the athleticism. You can teach the fundamentals. So I feel good about the Bills being able to do that. And then he's probably a little bit of a project. I think it's exciting right now, and you see those flashes and that tape that Eric's been showing. But just like the cornerbacks drafted in the similar spot that he was last year, they're going to have some, he's going to have some bumps coming into this league. Yeah. It's going to take a little bit. There's going to be a little frustration in year one, but overall I'm really excited. I gave this a little bit higher than you. I went with an a minus for this pick just because of the, you, you addressed it, right? We, this has been a monkey on this team's back for a few years. Cornerback two has been something you just haven't been able to get right. You get aggressive, you trade up, you get a guy that fits all the physical traits that you want and seems to be a culture fit that feels like a slam dunk, whether or not it works out right now, we're giving it an A minus. No, I think it's spot on. I think that that's the way to approach it. And I think we're both in that same range yeah, that, yeah. you know, yes, he's not a completely clean, perfect prospect. And that when I say I overvalued or over inflated the impact of the tackling issue that's not to say that there aren't tackling issues i think yeah, yeah. that there is some question about can he refine that and get that going but he checks so many other boxes and especially when you talk about his willingness to um the diligence and self-scouting aspect i have a feeling that's going to come along in, in that sense as it happens yeah i agree so that brings us to our next pick uh which was georgia running back james cook why don't you lead us off on that one yeah, so this one's tough for me, dude. I, this one is probably I've spent the most time like kind of contemplating and processing because at the moment of this pick, I really liked it. This is this 
the idea of a running back that can pass catch and has speed is something that I have wanted to inject into this office for years. What is Kenyon Drake? I've been begging for James white. Um, there's been a number of guys that have popped up. McKissick was big for me this year. There's guys in this draft that I wanted for that role. James Cook is a tough one because I do think I agree with Eric in the sense that there's some limiting things. Like you, you see the speed pop off in some plays and it's like, wow, that pops off. But then some plays, it doesn't seem like the speed is what he tests at. Um, there's not a lot of wiggle in this guy's hips. Like he's pretty straight line runner. If he's got a hole and he can beat you to a spot or force you to take a bad angle, he can probably beat you. He can get an explosive play. That's the exciting thing in the NFL. Those things that we see on tape and the, and the highlights are going to shrink up. Some of those holes aren't going to be there. You're going to have to create separation. You're going to have to create yards after catch. And I don't know if he can do that, but I don't know that he has to either. Right. The bills are, are seeing him seemingly more of like this wide receiver, third down back role, not necessarily going to put a lot on him to run between the tackles. And so with that in mind, yes, I like this weapon. How do we manufacture this guy some touches, get him explosive plays? Like I'm all about adding those types of explosive yards after catch plays to this offense. So I'm excited to see how they use him. But I do think, you know, with a second round pick, I, I kept seeing Rashad White. After I think that's what's really tainted this for me. And even after the fact of going through James Cook and looking at his all of his stats through uh, PFF and some of those yards after catch and production and receiving stats and Rashad White was right there in line with him. And unfortunately for us, he was available at that 89th pick and he got picked slightly after. So for me, knowing White was there, knowing the type of back he was, and I think probably a little bit more well-rounded in terms of what you could do with him it sort of devalues this cook pick for me and I can't shake it. Maybe you can talk me out of that, but overall I think the positives are the speed, that wide receiver ability, flexibility, being able to do some different things with him. And he gives you that third down back that we wanted. Some was something that they wanted to do with McKissick. Uh, the negatives are, I think he's that straight up runner, not shifty. He's not going to make you miss. He's not going to get the ball and find a way to make yep. you miss. He needs a straight lane. He needs a hole. Bills can create that. Um, and the negative is it doesn't give you balance. You still need to address what's going to happen with a Zach Moss type going for it, right? You, you had two type of back needs. You needed a third down pass catching. Let's get this guy in space back. And then something to either replace Devin Singletary or Zach Moss. And, and they didn't address that. So that's still going to be a need going forward after this year uh, when Singletary is hopefully uh, not getting a second contract in terms of, you know, who this hurts. Obviously it hurts Duke Johnson. Uh, he was brought in for this type of role. I think that that's tough. I don't. It's going to be interesting to see if the Bills say, you know, we like Duke Johnson because Duke can run the ball a little bit too, and maybe Zach Moss doesn't show enough to keep that job, and they keep Duke and Cook. But that's and, and maybe that's the type they're moving towards going forward. That's something that I want to be uh, that I'm pretty interested to see is what do they prioritize next now that they have their Devin Singletary and they have this pass catching back? Do they want sort of another pass catching back? Or are they going to stick with a guy like Moss that in some situations he can do short yardage? Maybe he's a special teamer going forward. But obviously, I think those two are going to have to battle out something for that second running back position going forward, because I, I just don't know necessarily who you take onto that 53 and who provides much more of a benefit. But definitely the running back room took a hit. And what was your grade for Cook? Oh, so my grade was, let's see here. What did I say? I think I gave that one a C plus. I gave it a C plus just because that, that being a pass catching back is something I think needed to get added to this offense. Yeah, I, I like it. And I'm, I'm in the same range. I'd be minus for, okay. we're close, uh, for James Cook. So both of them were, were right in line. Um, and for Cook, it was... Like you said, it was a very specialized role. He's not a feature back. He's not. Yeah. A, he wasn't even the starting you know, pr uh, primary back at Georgia, you know, he, the, you know, Zaire White had more carries and was more of the pri primary, um, more touches that, than Cook at Georgia, but he produced more yards than White. He produced a bigger portion uh, of what they did and he fit a role that we needed. And that, that was something you saw it in the McKissick investment. I liked it that they were approaching that in the way that, um, you know, obviously a priority for Ken Dorsey and what they wanted. And I think there's a possibility that if Aaron Cromer puts in more of that wide zone look, maybe he could be more valuable in the um, area here. And I was about to say this. I, I like this um, uh, from a man CP here. I liked it that we traded back twice and they didn't force it if they saw yeah, the value. And I don't true. know if that meant that they were kind of even between Cook, 
White and Spiller, and they weren't sure which one they wanted or that they were okay. And obviously they had Cook higher because they took right. the other two were on the board, right. um, but that they were okay because there were three backs there and that they moved back a couple of times to pick up um, extra assets. I, I like that idea. But uh, ultimately I put it at a B minus and, and that I agreed with your winners and losers. I think that that was um, the right way to approach it in that, hey, we needed that weapon. We like the possibility of adding a guy like that and that we already had the insurance with Duke Johnson, but then got a younger, faster, more explosive guy. Um, and Cook does have nice acceleration and explosion. Yeah. Um, so I think that he's going to add something there. And if that can give us the element of a screen game in this in this offense and, you know, some of the things, a lot of the lineup where he was literally out wide or in the slot, I lined up as a wide receiver. I like that variability that you can line up that way and then motion back into a backfield and catch the other team um, in off, you know, uh, personnel and be able to, to leverage that. I think he gives a little bit more flexibility than putting Devin Singletary out wide technically does that, but no one's actually afraid of that or putting somebody out there that you can then take advantage of uh, the way that you can with a guy like Cook. Yeah, definitely. He's got that 8 point, what was it, 8.76 RAS. So again, yeah. look to the RAS. Uh, plus, plus half point. Absolutely. Pedigree. Is there too? Brother in the NFL knows that knows how to do this. So those are things. Again, those are small little check marks they need to be keeping an eye on going mm-hmm. forward in these next drafts. And Sal uh, brought this up when you do look at some of the other comparisons, as far as like the stats that Brees Hall put up, the stats that Rashad sure. White put up, the stats right. that Isaiah Spiller put up. I guess Spiller technically was in the SEC as well, um, but that at least Cook did it in the SEC and in the toughest division in the SEC oh, to be able to put that up. So you definitely. have that potential versus some of the numbers that when Brees Hall and Rashad White do it when you're in the Pac-12 or Big 12, it's, you know, a much lesser defense. Yes, up that Georgia still great. was an incredibly dominant team, Machine. even within that division. So I was just saying this to my brother, a Bears fan, or my dad, actually a Packers fan, because they drafted a couple Georgia dudes. And I was like, it's tough to scout that Georgia defense because are they so good because they're all so good? and they were just totally dominant or are they individually that good that when they came together, it was just super dominant. So that's tough. One thing that I'm going to die on a hill now though, is uh, that the bills actually were interested in cam Taylor Britt at a safety position where is, which is what Cincinnati Bengals did two picks ahead of him. And you'll never convince me otherwise. And also I was right that cam Taylor Britt would be a second round pick. So I'm yes. going to own on that one for a little bit. Cause it was probably the only thing I got right about this entire draft process. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I've actually seen a handful of people, a couple in the chat here mentioned about, um, they, they didn't think he was happy about getting drafted to Buffalo. And I, I don't, oh, that's ridiculous. I don't think that, I don't think, I don't that's think the that case. was, I don't mean to um, say that's ridiculous. I didn't interpret anything I saw yeah. as like a Stephon actually, Gilmore, like he was totally unhappy. Correct. I, and I actually because people were so over the top about it when i watched it i was like i didn't understand that i didn't get that vibe at all he's obviously not the most like high energy not everyone's tim person yeah yeah not everybody is like super high you know revving their engine like that all the time he's obviously he even said uh, he did an interview with maddie glab uh today that was a little bit more you know personal um he said he's a quiet reserved person like not Matt Milano's like that. We don't think Matt Milano hates it in Buffalo. He's just a quiet reserved person that you don't hear talk very often. Yeah. Um, you know, James Cook's going to be like that. He's not going to be doing a ton of interviews after this. Cause that's not what he's into. I wouldn't read into that. Oh, he wasn't like super outwardly exploding is that he wasn't happy in yeah. Buffalo. He, he, his one, his son was crying and that two, he was mad at his family because he couldn't hear the people on the phone telling him where he was drafted to because everyone was screaming yeah. and going at it so you know it, in it's three um, in three even if he was mad i don't care he got drafted to play here and he has to do a good <laughs> job while he's under contract because it's yeah. important to him it's economics he, if he does a good job he gets more money, gets more money. It, yeah so i mean yeah would i rather players be super excited and talk about mafia and table slam after they get drafted absolutely i love everyone to embrace us and scream not everyone's like that i'm sure he's totally fine like you said he seemed like just kind of a reserved guy like that's just yeah. who he is i didn't read any into it that there's any unhappiness or he didn't want to be here i mean dude what those days are gone guys of yeah. players not wanting to be here you're gonna be in prime time football you've got a chance to go to a super bowl in the first year in the nfl like I'm sure his brother is actually jealous yes. that he was able to go to a Super Bowl contender instead of getting stuck playing with Kirk Cousins for another year. Yeah, that comment actually came out. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that that was one of the things Elvin <laughs> said. 
Um, all right. So next we are moving on to our third round pick and, and probably, you know, for me, one of the more surprising picks here. Uh, so I wanted back. I wanted a running back. I wanted a linebacker. I was now at this point in the draft over three on the yeah. names of those positions. yelling for an interior offensive lineman. I, Come on. God, I wanted a guard real bad. Yeah. Um, so, you know, cornerback, running back, linebacker. And at this point, I think what a lot of people assumed that if we were picking a linebacker, it was only picking a linebacker to replace or be the insurance policy for Terrell Edmonds. So when that happened, I think that everyone only viewed it through that prism of, yeah, but this guy isn't a big hulking middle linebacker. Right. And what they failed to realize is, I think this draft pick was actually the replacement for A.J. Klein. And that replacing A.J. Klein as hey, we need a legitimate NFL caliber third linebacker. And when we want to play three linebacker sets, we do, teams used to do this to us intentionally. They would get us in those heavy sets. Kansas City did it. Get us in those heavy sets and then split out wide and get A.J. Klein isolated in coverage where he was a problem. Well, now if you have a Terrell Bernard, you have a guy who can run tackle and, and blitz and play normal in the box linebacker, but isn't a liability in coverage and can play out there. So I don't think he's, he's obviously not a replacement for um, Terrell Edmonds or uh, Tremaine Edmonds. He's not a replacement for Matt Milano, who's under contract for a chunk of time. I think he's the AJ Klein replacement. Now, if you want to ask, did we need to spend a third round pick on the versatile movable piece for AJ Klein? I don't know. Maybe not. Um, but I've kind of, that's where I have my head around it. I still had it as a C. I think that we could have done better at that spot, but I've come around on the pick and how it can be used. Um, I think as far as winners and losers, I actually think Tremaine Edmonds is a winner from this, that they didn't draft a bigger, uh, middle linebacker. I think that both Terrell Dodson and probably AJ Klein are losers. Cause I think that there was a real possibility we went back after AJ Klein and maybe even a slight hit to Saran Neal, because Saran Neal was some people thought of, oh, they built in a little upside in this contract in case he plays more defensive snaps. They drafted the guy to be the tight end stopper, to be the third big guy on the field that they needed to bring Neal in because he was bigger than um, Taron Johnson. And I think Terrell Bernard is that guy. Otherwise, they wouldn't have picked him in the third round. Um, so I kind of had it as a negative for Terrell Dodson, A.J. Klein, and Serene Neal is kind of semi losers for this pick. Uh, I agree with all of them except for Neal. I don't think. I think Neal's going to be that guy starting. I think that this pick. So this is why I'll start right out with. I gave this a C minus, and this okay. is my least favorite pick in this entire draft. Even though Greg Cosell uh, was on One Bills yeah. Live and loved the pick, he said he was a player that he really liked in this draft. And I love Greg Cosell. He's one of my favorite yeah. listeners. Very smart guy. Yeah, one of the reasons I tune into One Bills Live when he's on. Um, so, I, but I still don't love it. I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around it. I like the motor. I like that there's a scheme fit and familiarity with the tape and, and the scheme and what he's asked to do. There seems to be a culture fit and that he's a leader. He was the heartbeat of yes. that team, right? Like all that stuff matters. Dave Aranda, one of Sean McDermott's right Absolutely. hand guys. Yeah, I, tons of familiarity there. Um, I just don't love the value of this pick as a third round pick. Because like you said, like, you picking this high up, then there's an expectation that he has to be on the field. And I don't know from what I've seen so far that it's better than I anticipated when we were live at the draft. And I was like, who the hell is this guy? I have no idea who this is. And there, there was some better stuff. I can, I can vouch. That was almost a direct quote. Yeah, I think it was all of us. We we're like, Jesus Christ, we have, we better go get to work for the rest of the night. Like, who's I gotta this? go find out what this guy does. Yeah. And why we and just him. It's probably better than I thought, but it's not. I, there's a lot of stuff. I'm trying to wrap my head around how to say this one. I think seeing Twitter's reaction to this and that he's going to be a safety or he's going to this big nickel, like he's coming in to be the big nickel. And there's all these like things that he's going to be this sort of positionless player that a JOK type player he's is not a future safety. And it doesn't feel like that's it. And so I think that's also sort of um, blurring my grade and frustration with this pick, because I think people are going to expect more out of him than we I, ultimately Right now, my ceiling for this player is like a very good special teams player. That more a uh, Tyler Manikevich might have a, okay. a a loser in this roster because I think that's where he's going to start out. And I think maybe long term play is 
that third linebacker. If the Saren Saren Neal thing doesn't work out, I think they're going to give him this year to be that tight end, come in and be the big guy on defense. And it seems like it's hanging that way. I think that that was what they talked to him about when they brought him in on this new contract was that there was going to be a chance to play on the defensive side of the ball. And that maybe they over, reached here with a third round pick to get a guy that's just going to be a depth special teamer here for the next couple of years and won't get on the field and, and contribute right away that's how i see it so i gave it a c minus i have a tough time giving any team a d like that's a real tough one but this is the lowest grade that i'm going with just because another thing about this one it's rashad white was there two picks later um where this sort of goes in line with the value of that i didn't love of cook you could have had white here and i think got the same type of back and you would have had a productive player in 2022 sure. And who knows what you could have gotten with that second round pick. I have to go back and look again who was there for them. But I think you could have got probably three productive 2022 players where I don't know outside of special teams, which is production sure. in a sense. Sure. Those are snaps. But I don't know that you're getting meaningful, meaningful defensive snaps out of Bernard in 2022. And, and I'd like to get a little bit more out of your third round pick. I think that's fair. And, and I, obviously we hope that he produces more than what we're saying and is ready to hey, get on. We were field. wrong about Spencer Brown a year ago doing yeah, the show. A, we were wrong about our third round pick <laughs> last year. Um, we liked the long-term upside, yeah. but we didn't want to see him on the field. And yeah. he ended up looking great. I love being um, wrong. So yeah, hopefully we're wrong about Bernard too. And he's yeah. ready to play right now. And is the guys in the chat talking about, is this more positionless football? Yeah. Hopefully that's the case. And well, um, that's Sal here with- says blitz specialists will play in those situations. But th- here's what I will say though. Like I get that. But like Taron Johnson's kind of a blitz specialist too. Yeah. Like he's very, that's a very good role. I wouldn't take him that. off the field in that situation. It would be very limited situations that I would need. It would have to be that he took in. that Saran Neal role from yeah. Saran Neal. And Saran Neal is actually a pretty good blitzer too. Like yeah. the things that Saran Neal is not good at would be like man to man coverage, right? Yep. Like he can do well in zone. He's fine there. He is a good blitzer. He's good in run support. I don't want to see him in man to man coverage, but I also don't want to see Bernard. He can also pattern match. So I don't know that there's a strength that Bernard has. That's over Neil at this point. Yeah. So we'll see where that one goes. Yeah. Um, I, I do think he plays special teams. I think he's a game day active early on. Yeah. I think he does those things. We'll see where it morphs. In For a third round pick, there. he better. Yeah, yeah, no, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, but he's still got to beat out Terrell Dotson and Saran Neal for any other actual defensive snaps. So we'll yeah. see where that one goes. So we're flipping from one of uh, the ones I question more to – I'll say my second favorite because I can't lie and say it was my favorite. Um, my second favorite pick of the draft. I'd like Khalil Shakur coming in, wide receiver from Boise State, super good yards after catch, had more uh backfield carries and rushing yards than Debo Samuel did when he was at South Carolina, was an elite punt returner and a good kick returner. Um, check so many boxes of what I wanted. He is to me what a young Emmanuel Sanders would have been with uh josh allen in that he is a really good slot receiver very good at getting open in the slot very good in their ability to go elsewhere but also can play outside and play outside receiver and can be a return man and can get on the field you can use him on jet sweeps you can use him in all those different ways plus he's four inches taller and 30 pounds heavier than isaiah mckenzie and just so many things that he can do i think that he comes in and is our um day one uh kick returner and punt returner is our slot receiver of the future but might even get some wide receiver four snaps in a couple spots especially as the season goes along um i don't think this was some like slam dunk we got a first round grade later on but i had it as an a you know getting a receiver this good in the fifth round that most people that i value had him as a top hundred player and that in my mind I'm just going to tell myself Khalil Shakur was the third round pick and Terrell Bernard was the fifth round pick. Sure. And then everything in the world makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm really happy with this pick. And I think this is one that's going to be very popular um, as the season goes along and as a guy that people are going to like long-term. So, um, you know, from a winners and losers, obviously long-term, I don't think this is great for Jamison Crowder or Isaiah McKenzie in that, you know, I think he can be that long-term slot. I don't know that he does much with them short-term. It's obviously not great for Marcus Stevenson or anyone else going for that return job because uh, I think he's going to be able to do there. And, you know, I, I think that those are the impacted players on the roster, even if I think that's more of a 2023 spot for him to get consistent wide receiver snaps. Yeah, uh, I think this pick is freaking dope. I love this pick. This was my favorite pick of the draft by far. Uh, not even close. I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. I don't even have negatives to talk about about this pick. Not because, the fifth round, I don't. <laughs> not because, not, yeah, exactly. Not uh, Pick 148, 
like you said, I, this probably should have been a top hundred pick. Um, I think they got a steal here. You get a guy that sees 8.32 off RAS again, where we're talking about traitsy dudes. He, he gives you a need in terms of you have to have something f- to replace Crowder. I don't want to do this every year where you're chasing that Beasley yeah. older what, one year band aids over. Yeah, and over. I, I would not, I would like to get past that and continue to fill this room. And I think this is sort of similar to that game davis vein where you bring a guy in i think he immediately comes in he's your number four i think same thing he gives you that versatility to be slaughter outside god forbid something happens to one of the two we were mm. talking about this at the draft greg you eric and i is you know if something happens in the slot you have isaiah mckenzie crowd there's some options there in the slot that you can move things around if something happens to a gabe davis there's not a lot of Jake options. Kumaro? Yeah, what are you Call doing? Call up Marcus Stevenson from the practice squad? Yeah, it's going to get real tight, right? So to be able to have a guy that has that flexibility to be your number four receiver, come in immediately and be able to step into those roles, I love it a, a, a ton. He reminds me, your uh, comp was Emmanuel Sanders. And somebody, I forget who it was, I wish I could give him credit, I saw on, on Twitter over draft weekend was comping Robert Woods. And I can't shake it out of my head when I watch this kid. Um, just like... At more athletic than you would think he is by the style, like the way he looks when he plays. Robert Woods always felt that way to me, where it's like, man, he's actually way more athletic than he shows he is. And then out of nowhere, he'll go up and get this one handed contested catch out of nowhere. Uh, it, the ball just sticks to him. So he, he's a fun guy that I think that the Bills are going to be able to get into space early on here, uh, find ways to get him on the field, get him into space, get the ball in his hands and see what he can do. I don't believe in yak guys, but he is a guy that has run after catch ability where he can make players miss. He's a little bit shifty. He, he's always falling forward. So I think that he's a guy that they're going to try to, you know, this seems to be something they're really looking for this offseason. Josh Allen has talked about working on his game. And, and turning up that yak uh, and putting in ball placement, you go get James Cook, who was uh, had a ton of yak in college, and now you get Shakir, who's also a guy that had a good amount of yak. I think that um, that's a priority for the Bills. I just really absolutely love this pick. I think the loser is a ton is Isaiah McKenzie because I think this closes the door on him returning and being especially the combo like, of Cook and Khalil Shakir. That combo. yeah. Yeah, I think I think some of those jet sweep things you can get out of Cook. I think you can get some of it out of Shakir here. I, it makes it really – it limits what Isaiah McKenzie's ability to get on the field is because he was already limited since he wasn't trusted to be a returner anymore. I know he's working on that, but I feel like this kind of closes the door on that conversation. There might be a competition for it, but sure. you want to Same limit. idea. He, he has to know straight out beat up. Jameson yes. Crowder for the slot receiver role. That, that's yes, it. and that's one I just don't see happen. I don't see him as a refined enough player. It stinks because I think we talked about this over the draft week. And it's not like you can just easily move on from McKenzie. I think you've got him on this he's roster. Still nice depth. Yeah, he's fine depth, but not, I think he goes from the guy that was, all right, he's a gadget guy. Maybe he's your fourth receiver that can just be a slot backup to now you've got a versatile fourth receiver that can be that now he's kind of hanging on that fifth like maybe is this guy game day active regularly like especially without the special teams ability it's going to make it tough to carry him on a game day active if, week in week out if you lose those two battles whoever loses the starting slot receiver battle and loses the punt returner kick returner battle and you don't cover kicks like jay kumaro does on on kickoff punt coverage yes it's really hard for that tough spot fifth receiver to be game day active if you don't do one of those if you're not a slot receiver you're not going to get reps you're not a returner and today. you're not a coverage guy it does make it tough and then an injury happens and you're so limited to you could only come in if crowder's hurt yeah essentially or cooks hurt and you want to run a jet sweep or something some type of scenario yeah. you, you just got to win one limited. of those two competitions yeah yeah so it's a tough one for him but yeah no this is absolutely slam dunk a plus for me for shakir i think this might end up being the pick of the draft and everybody's favorite player from this draft. Hmm. I love it. I love it. Um, next, uh, you can take a break here for a little bit if you want. Cool. Um, the ne- the next pick we were, so we tried hard not to spoil picks on Twitter and not to look as they happen. We try to be able to listen and, and, and hear it announced live uh, of where it was. We were in the sports book at I the blew lovely this, by the resorts way. world it. where it was. Um, as it happened, we were listening live and it was pretty quiet in the sports book where we were at. And I yelled so loud when they picked him that I startled the table in front of us and had to apologize. And Aaron didn't have the video going live quick enough to catch me yelling out at what the pick was. Um, so obviously 
you know, Matareza in the sixth round, 180th pick overall, 50 picks after the first punter went off the board because when the Buffalo Bills traded up in the first round and they traded away their fourth round pick, they traded pick 130 to the Baltimore Ravens. And if at that spot you had told me we traded away the pick that the Ravens were going to pick a punter with, I would have been furious because, of course, it was going to be Matareza. And instead, they picked Jordan Stout out of Penn State. So to get Matareza 50 picks later with a sixth-round pick, it married up. We talked about it after the show between you, myself, and Eric. It married up everyone's comfort level because I, I wanted him anyways and was willing to overspend a little bit. You guys were more reasonable in that don't draft punters, but if you're going to, at least we get the contract control and a cheap one over time. And instead, we get the guy that all the fans wanted, and the you know all the story that goes around with Punt God and everything with it. Um, it's a really fun fit. Sixth round, low cost, cheap four year contract, and a fun guy to root for. This is a great pick. I, I gave it an A. Like you know, it, we waited long enough to be able to pick a guy where you can't even argue about overspending for a punter uh, in, in that spot. And that you tell me there's a sixth round pick that's a virtual guarantee to make the roster. Um, I'll take that with any six round pick. Yeah. I'm not as excited uh, as you are about this pick, <laughs> but I just, it's punters, man. I just have a tough thing with punters, but um, I give it an A plus here. Again, we're looking at 9.49 RAS yeah. for a punter. He's, he's a legitimate like division one yeah. athlete right. who happens to punt. Yeah, totally. Um, I, it was a need. You knew Brandon Bean was going to address this position at some point in the offseason after his comments uh, at, at, to end the season last year. And the value of a six round pick for a guy that it's weird for me to say this about a punter's uh, potentially generational punter, I think, from what I'm hearing. The uh, highlights. So if that's true, getting that in the six round a slam dunk to me, that's an A. Plus. I would say the only thing that causes me any kind of pump the brakes at all is I trust the Ravens, especially with special teams yep. and the fact that they came up and had their selection, knowing that they were targeting punter and went with stout that just sent like a little signal in my brain. That was just like, Hmm, that's something that I don't know why they did that. And Twitter didn't know why they did that. And now I'm wondering if there's something about my guy or not, but I'm going to look past that and hope that we have the two swaggiest, baddest ass specialists in the league. I think this is a great spot to be in when your roster is so good that you can add specialists in the draft and get really good, solidify them at a young age and get that controlled cost through a Super Bowl run. Uh, this could be a special special teams unit now that you got Ferguson, who, who's a longtime snapper. I think he's one of the better snappers in the NFL. Yes. And you add him with these two guys. And I think, you know, the one concern about him not being able to hold, I think you got him in a room with Ferguson and, and Tyler Bass. I think this will get figured out here throughout the summer. I'm not super worried about that leaking into the season. I think they're going to get this right, especially him being a super athlete. I think he'll pick this yeah. up pretty quickly. So very happy that they addressed this uh, position and that you got your punk god. Well, so a couple things to add into that. One, we still have Matt Hawk under contract. Sure. Matt Hawk was a elite holder and is still there and is going to be able to train him how to do that. You're also training a guy who isn't some Australian rules holder who's never caught a football before. Like he's a right. legitimate athlete who can catch footballs. Like he's, he's probably already been working on it. And has. There's lots yeah. of videos of him doing it one-handed yeah. and all kinds of different stuff yeah. and you know, all the things that go along with the, the highlight videos. Uh, but he's been working on it, and he actually mentioned some of the, the kickers, NFL kickers and punters he's been working with to train mm -hmm. him on how to do that. You then add in the fact that part of it, and it, some of the guys in the chat are talking about it here, he's only punted for one year. Yeah. This is the only year that he's punted. He you know, just switched over. He actually has like a 95% field goal accuracy uh, as a field goal kicker, but had the punter was uh, an you know, upperclassman when he got there and had the job, so he just focused on field goal kicking, and then this year did both and was able to be the punter too. So he's still developing his – you know, his accuracy, the directional coffin corner stuff. And Jordan Stout was a much more developed punter that way. Yeah. But again, you're still getting that upside of the. But you know me, Greg. I don't need upside in special teams. I want consistency in yes. special teams. And so my concern here is the upside's sexy. I get it. If there was ever a time to be, I was, before we started watching this, you were like, hey, how you doing? And I was like, watching punting highlights. I don't think that's ever happened. <laughs> 
<laughs> once in my life that I like yeah. gone to YouTube to watch a punter. It's fun. It's exciting. I get it. My concern, you know what I want out of this. I just want, I want consistency and maybe we eventually get it. Maybe it happens right away. Tyler Bass was, this, I was having the same conversation with you about Tyler Bass just a couple of years ago and, and that I was worried about a rookie coming in and yeah. that lacking consistency. And maybe he can address that early, but I, sometimes the gamble, I don't know, is always worth the paying off on the traits and the talent and the big plays is really cool but I would hate to lose the idea that we could get a real consistent polished guy right away, especially well, in the height of the Super Bowl run. And I will say, don't mistake a lack of refinement. I think Mark's co- uh, comment is very accurate here. His downside is he doesn't range in the power and he overdoes it several times. Sure. He doesn't have shanks, which is the inconsistency we yeah, had yeah. with Bajorquez and with Matt Hawk is that, yeah, a 60 yarder is great, but not when you mix in a 19 yarder and a 23 yarder. He doesn't do those. He's consistent. He just only has a bazooka. He only has the 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 you know big explosive one. He doesn't have the sniper rifle to put it exactly where he wants. He's right. working on that. So consistency wise, if we're trading in a few more touchbacks than what I would like, I'm okay with that. If there's never a 19 yarder sure. or a 17 yarder in a playoff game, which is, right. you know, my least favorite ever. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts you, before we go deeper into Matareza? Is that... Uh, no, because <laughs> after this, it gets a little, it, this episode starts to finish off quicker, uh, from here on out. Yeah. Uh, I, what, uh, were there any losers besides Matt Hawk? In the, yeah, no, just, Hawk. In the, just yeah. Matt Hawk. I'm yeah. pretty sure that's the only, only loser here. All right. So our next pick is cornerback out of the FCS level from Villanova, Christian Benford, um, who uh, Brandon Bean did say they may look at for safety in the future. This is a guy who obviously I, I can't lie and say I did a ton of work on Villanova coming into this draft, um, but have had a chance to dive in. I know Chris Tapasso was a big fan of his, um, and I think Greg Cosell was a fan of his mm-hmm. as well, um, in that they see potential for immediate special teams impact. This was uh, a guy who was there, and if you're going to develop, he had high-end ball skills. I think it was like 17 passes, pass breakups and seven interceptions. So obviously, if you're at the FCS level and you get drafted in the NFL, you should dominate, and you should just be a superior player to everyone yeah. else who's around you. But at least he did that. At least he was. I think he was the highest graded corner in FCS by PFF standards, plus seven interceptions, 17 pass breakups. So there's always a reach when you're going into that level, but if you're going to do it, at least have it be a guy that did dominate the competition in that realm. So um, I'm going to grade it a C because I, I, I'm not going to pretend that I had huge upside on this player or see right. some path for him to turn into some hidden secret uh, all pro. I love the RAS score. I love the upside. I think that there's the ability to be able to be a special teams <laughs> contributor. And then if we have versatility and he ever sees the, the field defensively, that's a bonus, but in the sixth round, if you have a guy who can get on the field in special teams, I think that's great. I think this is a – I don't think there's any winner per se in this one, but it's probably not great for Cam Lewis, uh, Elijah Griffin, Nick McLeod, uh, just because it's another investment in that area and that they were going to have to fight from a special team standpoint, and he is a superior athlete to those guys from size and RAS score. And special teams is a lot of size and RAS score. Can you get down the field quickly for your size? Um, so I think it's kind of a loss for those guys. But I'm just going to name it a C because I, I don't know that I see a high likelihood beyond special teams. Yeah, I'm just scratching the surface on really digging in here. This was a guy I totally missed. I'd spent, like I said, spent a lot of time on corner, especially those late round guys trying to find a discount. You know me, I like to thrift. I was into this double dip idea. If we miss out, get a third and a six, whatever it was. This guy totally fell off my radar. So just kind of catching up here. Um, my first sort of look at him immediately flies off. This is a player that I'm going to like an adequate cornerback that <laughs> a six round pick that you know has a shot in terms of being able to get ball skills type things that that's a path to the roster if you can come in as a rookie and, and make some plays in the preseason get your hands on balls that's how you stick onto a roster is, is making those big splash plays so excited to see him i think this will be a guy that i'm rooting for you got that 8.15 ras score so again um 
going with the athletic guys. I agree with the, if you're going to be at the FCS level that you need to dominate, but they're even at the dominating side of it, there's still a huge, huge leap going to the NFL. Some of the balls, these FCS quarterbacks throw, like I, I hate to say that I could break on it, but some of these ducks <laughs> guys could break on these balls. Like, uh, it's just a different level of play. So You're there's not covering be, Gabe Davis or Stefan Diggs. No, this is definitely a, a developmental piece for the Bills defensive backs coach and, and to get him in there and see what they can do with him. I don't think there's any pressure. I think Brandon Bean left that open. He could play cornerback. Maybe they can play him with safety. I don't think there's any pressure. It's a player you like. Get him in and find a way to get him involved in the game. Uh, for I, I also gave it a C uh, for the same reasons you did. I'm not fully uh, grasping where I see him yet in his future, but I, I think at the start it's teams. And for that reason, I think you were right in that it hurts the bottom of the cornerback room. But I still think, you know, this draft as a whole and, and this pick sort of hurts Tyler Manikevich's of the world, the Taiwan Joneses of the Taiwan world, Jones. that they're aging out of these special teams roles and you're bringing in youth on contract control. That's going to become more and more of a premium for years. Brandon Bean has put a big premium on bringing in veterans for these special team roles and maybe paying them more than you would like to necessarily, mm-hmm. even though they're not making big money, but maybe you could get a guy in that's a rookie and get him into the special teams role. And I think that's what they're going to try to start doing here backfilling. Cause as you get that Super Bowl window more open, you hand out bigger and bigger contracts. It's going to get harder to bring in special teams aces from other teams and pay them market value versus getting guys like this and develop them, developing them into special teams players. So keep an eye out for those aging vet special teams guys as they continue to bring in guys like this. Yeah, I, I think it's a smart way to look at it. And those are very logical uh, winners and losers from it. Um, our next pick in the, again, again, another sixth round pick is offensive lineman Luke Tenuta. Um, initially, this looked like an outlier. He was actually the only below average combine rat Very score. Below. But when you looked at what he did on his pro day, it actually shot him back up into an elite right. rat score, which I'm going to. But they don't it. go. Kent doesn't use. Correct. He, if pro they Because the they can be inflated, right? Yes. So he did that. Now I'm going to say I'm at least going to take it with a grain of salt that he did. That's probably that somewhere well in between. There, that is probably somewhere in between. It's probably maybe he just had a bad day at the combine. Sure. It's probably not the 9.1 that the pro day was, but I'm guessing he's probably legitimately above average and not below average where he was. So um we'll see what that is. He's actually a, another really tall player. So I know a lot Very of people tall. have asked, can he play guard? There ain't a lot of six eight guards in the Here's, NFL. Yeah, this happens every time they get a real tall guy. I don't know why we want to put a six, eight person in the interior. One thing that's kind of odd. I, I maybe should go look up the stats on this. It feels like Josh Allen for his size. There's a lot of balls that get hit or something deflected at the line. Script. I don't know that I want to add more tall things to get in his way, especially in the interior. That just seems maybe, I don't know, yeah. uh, but putting a really a six, eight guy right in front of your quarterback seems like a bad idea. Yeah. And for this one, you know, at least played at a legit school at Virginia sure. tech, you know, had a good amount of starts, some good um, prospects from there, yeah. You know, so yeah, it's not a bad school to come from. I will say there was a handful of offensive line prospects I really liked. Lacita at that Smith point was in the draft. The Lacita point. Smith, Chris Paul, you know, multiple guys and that more I, really, need. I really thought would have been a bigger fit at a position that had a better chance of making the roster. We'll talk about that with UDFAs here at the end. So right. I actually had to I had to knew it as a C minus. Um yeah. I don't see a path with Questenberry and um Tommy Doyle on the roster. This was the first one that I can't even talk myself into a 53 man roster spot. I think Benford's unlikely, but has a shot. Like he could win the special teams role Mm -hmm. and make the 53 man roster. I don't see any realistic chance in 2022 that Luke Tenuta makes the roster. Um, It doesn't mean he won't develop on the, on the practice squad. And if that pro day rest score is real and you know, six, eight, and you have that kind of, um, height to, to be able to do it maybe he can be a swing tackle in the future and that has value if you take a stab at it but he was actually the least likely to make the roster of any of the eight picks including the next one we'll talk about here so i was a little bit down on that in that you know to me this was one of those preemptive udfa signings they just did it in the sixth round um and i see tenuda being a camp body and then a practice squad and then we'll see in the future but i I didn't see anything in the immediate term that told me he could make this roster. Yeah. I think that this point in the draft to me 
started to feel like, hey, we're getting a head start on undrafted free agency because we're not sure what type of guys we're going to be able to get in free agency. We know Brandon Bean was a little bit worried about that as the roster gets better, not being able to land the guys he wanted because agents aren't going to want your guys to go there without a real shot or a path to the roster, right? He's come out and said that before. So I think he treated these last two picks as a little bit of insurance on undrafted free agency because I agree with you. I don't necessarily see a path here to the roster. Um, Maybe, yeah, like they're saying here, maybe you could replace your Bobby Hart role with a really couldn't get much worse, right? Like I know I always say you shouldn't say that, but with Bobby Hart, I, but that's probably the closest you can say to it couldn't get much worse. Uh, but yeah, maybe it's some developmental prospect. I also give this a C minus. I was pretty salty about this pick, honestly, because I really like Chris Paul and I really like Lasita Smith, and they were both still hanging out there. And I would have loved to have addressed the interior offensive line. It's the position I want have wanted to address for three years and maybe I'll get my turn. Bruce got his athletic quarter cornerback. You got your punter. Maybe I'll get my interior offensive lineman next year. But uh, so for a C minus for this one and we'll see how it goes. Um, and then if you want, I can segue right into the next pick here. Please, um, yeah, we can go with uh, it's a uh, Balen Spector, a linebacker out of Clemson. And this pick, man, I don't know, undrafted free agent type thing for me. This is a, Hey, uh, again, big RAS, 9.13 RAS, super athlete, um, can come in and play special time teams, good tackler. This might be a guy that instead of Benford getting that spot, I think that that's these guys are competing with each other for that either last yes. special team spot that's going to be on the roster. The next Taiwan Jones or Manikevich of this team going forward, it's going to be down to one of those two guys, or at least that's how I see it playing out here in camp. But I can't see a path for him other than really balling out on special teams and getting one of those spots early. Yeah. Daryl here saying dollar general Terrell Bernard. Pretty much. Um, no, you're spot on. They're very, yeah. very similar in height, weight, More like dollar score, tree. Yeah. Um, everything that was there. Um, and Balen Spector, I, I think again, similar to Christian Benford is going to be fighting with sure. those last roster spot guys to push for a special teams coverage role um, and is a converted safety. Um, so again, has some coverage ability is a guy mm-hmm. that, you know, could hit in that sense of what they see as that Saran Neal, uh, Terrell Bernard role. I like having another guy that could do that. I know, I think it was Dane Brugler said, he's going to be a guy who's hard to cut on cut down day because he's sure. going to do everything. Like he's going to be able to fill in a bunch of different spots. We know that, uh, Sean McDermott's going to like people like that. Um, so again, I, I had this as a C, I, I think that I can at least see a path to the roster and whatever. It's a seventh round pick. You can't waste yeah. a seventh round pick. It's impossible. Um, seventh round picks have like a 40% chance of making yeah. NFL rosters, even in the, even in the year they get drafted. It's just 60% of these guys aren't going to make the roster anyways around the yeah. NFL. I um, still don't, I don't believe Brandon Bean wanted to leave with as many picks yeah as he ended up with and just had him and said we'll take a flyer on a special teams athlete yep yep and this is a developmental guy that i'm happy to have on the practice squad um and on the outside shot that he beats out you know that hey we don't maybe taiwan jones lost a step maybe they find that heck maybe both bail inspector and christian benford ball out and they're like hey we'll take the $2 million, $2.25 million in savings by cutting Tyler Medikevich. We don't think we're losing much. I, yeah. you know, I don't know that I expect that, but it's a non-zero it chance. There's a chance yeah. that that happens. Um, so ultimately, you know, I, I think it's fine, and I think he's a reasonable spot. And again, the same losers there, you know, that, hey, it's one less Andre Smith, it's one less Terrell Dotson, it's one less mm-hmm. guy like that that, you know, if he makes it, it's going to beat out a chance like right. that. Or he beats them out for a practice squad spot. Mm-hmm. So one last spot we want to go to before um, we go to any other non-roster players is there are a long list of undrafted free agents. They're going to keep bringing guys in to get up to 90 90 roster spots. But for me, there were two guys um, for the undrafted free agents who were interesting to me specifically because they were at two of the positions that I expected to be a draft pick. Mm -hmm. The first one was at tight end. I thought we were going to pick a tight end. I know Bean talked about that in his presser, that there was a spot that he might have done it, maybe that fourth round pick that we traded away. Um, And that a guy that Eric liked from a film standpoint, Jalen Weidermeyer from Texas Mm -hmm. A&M, he kind of got infamous for testing horribly at the combine, like literally maybe the worst tight end combine ever. And then, but when you watch it on film and Eric confirmed this, and I, I watch a lot of cutups, I didn't watch the the breakdown like he did. 
it doesn't look like a historically bad athlete. Like we right. watch him pulling away from safeties and corners to score touchdowns. We watch him take screens to the house for different things. Like, no, he's not some like Kyle Pitts or crazy athlete, but he was a perfectly fine athlete. Right. Um, and was a guy that I think has as likely of a chance of making the roster as Benford or Spectre. Like there's a chance he beats out Tommy Sweeney. And if they keep three tight ends, he could sneak onto this roster. So it's probably not a great chance. Probably, you know, it's probably a 40% chance they keep a third tight end. And he's probably 50, 50 with Tommy Sweeney. So a 20% chance to make the roster. Sure. Um, but it was at least a spot that I thought was interesting. Any thoughts on Weidermeyer before I mention the other? Yeah, no, I, this was one that as soon as the draft was starting to wind down, it was something exactly we talked about. You know, I posed that question to you and Eric almost the night before was, hey, you look at this Bills roster and like where do you, if you're an agent of a player, what position would you feel comfortable saying, hey, we can go to the Bills and latch onto a spot? And I felt like the only one that we really came up with was tight end and that Tommy Sweeney, that tight yeah. end three competing with Sweeney for a roster spot. I think Quentin Morris, and- another guy competing. Yeah, Morris has a chance too, but I think you insert Weidemeyer right here and he's right in line with those guys. I don't think that anyone has a huge leg up. I think Sweeney has a bit of a leg up just for being here and being part of the offense, but it's not much, right? And so there's a real path to a roster for undrafted free agent. I know where you're going with this next one. There is a path, but it's it's a little murkier. I think a tight end was a pretty clear straight path to, hey, there's going to be a real competition for tight end three this summer. Yeah, you know, so the the two spots that I wanted – going in were going to be tight end you know that that was one of the ones that was there and then the spot that i had in the top three maybe even argued second overall was guard and i was genuinely surprised you know especially dylan parham was hanging out there uh you know for for a while that that one broke my heart a little bit that that one would have been available um at the spot so later on they take a guy out of northwest missouri state tanner owen um pretty elite athlete you know coming from a lower level school um really high level RAS score was a guy that looked i think 9.11 um in, in his RAS score and was a guy that again i don't think it's super likely i don't think that he's going to beat out you know bacher and greg mance and cody ford and beat all those guys to take one of those spots but it's possible that those were the two spots that there was at least a chance that I could see a guy coming in and making a name for himself to be able to make this roster. So at minimum, I love the upside bet of bringing a guy like that onto the practice squad and seeing if you can develop him over time. Um, especially, you know, some of the refinement you'll bring in from a lower, uh, smaller school guy, but Tanner Owen was at least a name to watch out for out. You know, I don't think a UDFA is going to make this roster, but no. if any do, I think it would be wider Meyer or Tanner two. Owen. Yeah. And, uh, with guard spot too, it's a tough one because I think, I think you're right that this is, Hey, get him on the practice squad, see if we can develop him while they continue to try to push Cody Ford and maybe Aaron Cromer can unlock yeah. whatever they saw in Cody Ford going forward. But for now, I think you're, the best you're going to get is, hey, they believe in him more than we do. He's going to be on this team. He's going to be on this roster. And then hopefully this guy can develop in the background and, and allow you to move on from Cody Ford going forward if he doesn't have the type of year that or the type of development that they believe. But I think ultimately we're doing winners and losers uh, from this draft class, and we didn't really mention it. I think Cody Ford was very much a winner uh, because yep. of the lack I had of addressing. Him second, second on my list of <laughs> yeah, winners. yeah. So if we want to transition to winners and losers, that's yeah. a great time to do that because he was uh, third on my list of winners. Um, yeah. Here, let me uh, pull that up. So I had Jordan Poyer, big number one winner Easy of the day because one. there was so Easy much, one. there was so much conversation about him. Uh, not they, they were going to address safety early. There was conversation that they're going to trade up now because of this contract stuff. Nothing gets addressed really at safety at all. There's a, there's Ben Ford maybe can play safety down the road. That's not going to happen. I know people thought uh, with that third round pick that they were going to uh, transition that to safety. I, I don't believe that that's the case. Jordan Porter is very locked in as the safety of this yeah. team. And maybe you can talk a little about, we got Tyron Matthew contract down the lines, which mm-hmm. I think that at least lays some groundwork for the two sides in terms of negotiating. At least I don't know where they're at with what Poyer's asked for, but I think Brandon Bean can at least bring that back and say, here, whatever you ask for, if it's way high or way low, here's a parameter that we can work off of. Yeah. Teren Matthew signing with the new Orleans saints for three years, 33 million. I can promise you 
Drew Rosenhaus and Jordan Poyer did not love that contract. Yeah. They were probably hoping that he got more of a short term, bigger money, more guaranteed deal. Um, if that's a deal that Brandon Bean can even get close to, that would be fantastic at $11 million a year. I feel pretty confident they are waiving that Harrison Smith contract out for Minnesota yeah. saying, Hey, yeah. at this age one 32, <laughs> they gave him four years, 64 yeah. million and $16 million a year. Um, so we'll see where that and goes. And I do think, I think honey badger was a little underpaid in the market. Sure. Uh, sure. And uh, I it's because he couldn't stay on the field. He's, he, he's had trouble is the field. way more reliable so far. Right. Ba- uh, and, Matthew is. And I think versatile, like our d- different, not versatile because I think Matt, Tyron Matthew could do more. Um, I think Jordan Porter is more of a traditional, better safety, right? Box like safety. he's a box safety. And he can really do both things. He yeah. and Micah Hyde can be, uh, I think that's the increased value is the interchangeability of he and Micah Hyde specifically give him an increased value of Matthew where he's just kind of a, Hey, bring him in and we can make him a special weapon anywhere. So I think there, I would reapproach that and say, Hey, Porter has more value to you than any safety in the world with this defense. Yeah. And that's how I would approach it. But my well, other just to clear but, for yeah, yeah. Uh, 2022, uh, the peak of Teron Matthew is better than anything Jordan Poyer's ever done. Sure, Teron yeah. Matthew has three first team all pro seasons yeah, yeah. and one where he was borderline defensive player of the year in 2022. Jordan Poyer was better than Trent Matthews. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think probably trending. The, yes. And probably has been better. maybe the last yeah. two years. Yeah. Too. So Poyer was my top winner. Yep. Uh, Tremaine Edmonds got my second same. Uh, winner. I had, same... I, I had Cody Ford second, Tremaine Edmonds third. Yeah. We had the same top three. The same conversation, though, as uh, Poyer here. And a lot of people thought, hey, uh, Devin Lloyd was there for that first yep. round pick. And I was, a ton of people Act were telling me. Kobe the Dean was still there for a while. Yeah. That I kept, kept getting told that no way Devin Lloyd's there. And if he is, you make the tray, you worked all that out. Uh, they continue to stick by Terrain Edmonds. I think that this is a sign that I really do believe behind the scenes are trying to work out. I don't think it's going to be as bad as people think. I think it'll be probably worse than some fans want, but I think they get a deal done where they keep Milano and Edmonds going forward and maybe move on from somebody else that we don't want them to. Uh, but the lack of addressing that, I think, shows me where Tremaine Edmonds contracts at, that they have faith that Tremaine Edmonds is going to continue to be the guy for them. Cody Ford was my fourth. Uh, uh, of the winners, and then again, uh, Zach Moss. But I think that's interchangeable. Zach Moss or Duke Johnson. I'm wondering, sort of, how that's going to play out at camp with how they're using the running backs going forward. But I do think one of those running backs was a winner. So I agree. I even had Devin Singletary as a little bit like sure, yeah, because we didn't they didn't br- replace him with Bryce Hall. Bryce Hall. Yeah, correct. They didn't pick like a three down primary rushing sure. running back. Yeah. Um, I also had a little bit of a, a sneaky one with the young defensive ends that there was I don't so I didn't they didn't draft them yeah, to sure. pick well what you mean Johnson end, saying there. It, but <laughs> if they had have gone up and picked one of those other guys, yeah. um that would have been a shot at Boogie Basham Ray J. Epinesa. Sure. So the fact that they just didn't take a defensive lineman, period, I would say that's a pretty reasonable endorsement or, that they expect that. We've totally read this the wrong way. And Tremaine Edmonds is moving to edge. <laughs> to edge and it's all just a game. How it's all just dare a you? Game. How dare you? Um, but yeah, I agree. I, I agree that those were the, the overall winners. We talked about the losers we uh, as losers. we went along. Who else did you have as a loser that we haven't touched on yet? Well, let's see here. We had I had Hawk, we had yep. and Johnson, uh, Man Carriage Jones, Hodgkins. Uh, I don't think we mentioned Isaiah Hodges. That's a good one. Hodgins is one that this one's one I feel bad for because this is sort of just like once once you're in the cycle of the like once you get when into you the NFL, window. the wheels start moving. And if you miss, if you're not jumping on the bus when everybody else is, you can just fall right off and totally miss out on a career. And he's sort of in this fine point where he has, a, if he's healthy going into this preseason, this is kind of it for him. He has to put on a show to even probably make it to another team's roster. He's going to have to ball out here all summer. It's going to be a tough path to the bills roster. Hopefully he can get himself some tape here this summer to latch on somewhere else, because this was a prospect that I was high on just like in that draft process. I really liked him. We saw him that summer a little bit, really liked what we saw him this summer and then just injuries derailed him. So unfortunately another loser from this weekend there, uh, trying to think who else. Yeah, I think we mentioned everyone else. Dean Jackson, all the yep. corners underneath. I didn't have any surprise losers. Yeah, no, no, uh, one other name that actually came up here in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll throw Shaq Lawson in with the group of the young defensive ends because sure. he could. Both he or Jordan Phillips could have got FAO bodied 
Um, so sure. F.E. Obata, when he signed in for agency, yeah. didn't bank on the Bills drafting back-to-back defensive ends in the first and second round. Right. And there was a chance that a Devontae Wyatt or one of those players was just too good of a value to pass up. And all of a sudden, Jordan Phillips could be, oh, I signed back here, and now I'm not going to get to play. What the heck's going on? So maybe a slight positive sure. uh, for those guys. And, yeah, I agree. We talked about the special teams one, but I just jotted down special teams in general. This seemed yes. like a legitimate yeah. special teams investment draft in that Terrell Bernard, Matt Areza, Christian Benford, Balen Spector, all of their initial impact is very likely going to be on special teams. And Khalil Shakur is the returner. You know, that was a huge part of this yeah. draft and what the, at least in 2022, now that those guys can't do more in the future, but in 2022, six of the eight draft picks, clearest path is special teams. So any of those guys who are clinging onto the roster, you know, maybe that means a Jake Kumaro gets bumped and maybe that's the path where it's more as a McKenzie snaps or Khalil Shakur receiver snaps. Maybe that is saving some money on Tyler Medikevich or Taiwan Jones. Maybe that is one less spot for one of those guys somewhere that would have hung on and made it as a Andre Smith or, um, you know, Terrell Dodson, Markel Lee, right. Joe Giles Harris, guys like that now have a much steeper climb to make this roster. So I think all special teams, um, you know, 53rd guys got a, if you're a, a, a tough shot. If you're a special teams junkie, it's going to be a fun summer. Oh, yeah. Watching some oh, of those battles yeah. happen. So, you know, now ultimately, you know, kind of wrapping up here. Um, obviously, take a look at all the shows that we have going on. A ton of great content. You're going to see tons of breakdowns, um, film rooms, individual focus uh, groups, and all the different shows breaking down the entire draft class, the UDFAs, all the other guys that are out there. Uh, maybe this final fourth wave of free agency. Are there some veteran guys that could mm-hmm. float around and be an invite to camp? We have some of our training camp, mini camp, OTA dates are out there. Um, and we're excited for next week having the schedule release. So um, that'll be next Thursday night. We'll be able to bring that to everybody uh, with the excitement of everything that we're doing from that direction. Um, Aaron, what are you looking forward to as we kind of now shift out of draft mode? Yeah, man. Well, one, I'm going to do some self-scouting about how I process the draft because I definitely whiffed uh, a lot more than I normally do this year. And I don't know if that was laziness on my part and jumping on some of the things that other people were saying and just kind of taking their word for it. I don't know where I went wrong, but some of that stuff um, and just processing the draft as a whole. I felt like there was a number of times where you and I were we were all sitting there and seeing the guys that are still available and just being like, none of us know anything. This is so ridiculous. <laughs> seeing uh punk God go to the sixth round. Like yeah. if you would have told Earth us all a month ago, taken. people would have burned you off at Twitter. If you would have said like the bills would get them in the sixth. Sure. I remember Idiot. doing, I remember doing mock drafts when he first got on, my, the draft network and taking him in like the fifth or sixth and people are being like you're such an idiot there's no way he's past the fourth like you got to take him in the fifth or nothing at all like yeah. uh and just having those conversations over and over again we I don't thought he was know. gonna and go early fourth totally yeah and that's fair i'm not saying that that's not fair but it's these again what we started this draft process saying like these absolutes like people were telling me no way uh devin lloyd would be there at the bills pick there's no way nicobe dean was going to fall out of the first round like all these things are, and everyone just says there's no way but over and over again throughout this draft we just saw like wow people didn't have that nobody had that coming nobody even with this guy wasn't on anyone's radar so as much as we try to know, I, I think people get educated in the draft. I think more people have good information about the draft, but ultimately we don't know anything. So the, again, it just re it just recertifies for me. We cannot speak in absolutes when we're going into this process of this guy will never be there that you just don't know. And, and the mocks create such a fuzziness of how we think and where guys will be. So it's a fun process, still kind of breaking it all down, going through this, but really excited to, see some of these guys and build i'm still a homer fan at the end of the day so i can't wait to get to rookie mini camps where you get these guys uh, in a bill's helmet for the first time see them with their numbers running around like that's a super exciting time of season for me plus the weather in western new york that usually also signifies that the weather's getting better when the bills start coming back to town uh and, and then it's really getting through this off season with you. i'm really excited about the content that's coming up throughout the whole team here and getting ready to ramp up towards training camp this year that's always a fun sort of slow ramp up as we go through the roster and get ready for this training camp i'm really excited about this 2022 mm-hmm. team man I'm, I'm ready to get past that uh, that season last year and we got these new guys and reload up and go for a nice fun run with all you guys uh so i'm really excited about everything coming up i, I won't lie there's a little piece of me that every time someone says this, I legitimately go, 
oh yeah, we have Von Miller. That's yeah. fun. Like that I says, for, yeah, somebody said Nick I G forget said that now we have add, Von Miller. Now he said now add Von Miller. Yeah, no, sometimes I forget too, but uh it's awesome. It's so it's fun. A, it's a good thing to remember. <laughs> so make sure you guys check it all out. We have so much hard work going on. It's going to be so much fun. You guys were awesome in the chat tonight. This was a blast. Uh, make sure you're checking out Aaron Quinn at Aaron uh, Quinn 716. Find me at Greg Thompson. Make sure you're checking out all the other shows that are going on. Our, our sponsors over at bookseats.com. Help us out. Give us a like or a rating or review. It really helps us out. It makes a difference when people ask, what can I do to help? It's that. Tell somebody else about Tell the show. Friend. Somebody that you think would enjoy what we're doing. That word of mouth is huge for us to be able to help share a little bit about what we do. It really means the world. Um, and, and we would really, really appreciate it. So please take a moment, whatever you're listening on, you know, make sure that you're have your alerts turned on, that you're subscribing to the YouTube channel, that you're subscribed uh, to download every show on iTunes or Google Play or Spotify or iHeartRadio, wherever you're at. It really, really helps us a lot. So we appreciate it very much. Uh, but on behalf of Aaron Quinn, I am Greg Thompson. You've been listening to Cover One Buffalo and we are out. <laughs>